It's press row. We're back. Ohio State, Bowling Green. We people were all over the place. So a <laughs> couple weeks off. We've got a lot to talk about. Joined as always by Aaron Matthews, Todd Walker, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. First week of the boys' basketball season in the books. In the books. First weekend. It was exciting. What did we learn so far? There's. I feel like there's a lot of takeaways from the first weekend. I think we learned that. Uh... LCC is clearly the best team at the tip-off classic. That was pretty apparent after the... Didn't we know that going in? Well, though? yeah, but it confirmed rather okay. than learned. How about that? Uh, and and kind of disappointing because the last few years, the tip-off classic has been a classic with Bath and Elida playing at a very high level along with LCC. It was very much anticipated this year. Uh, you get the feeling it wasn't anticipated much at all. And uh, the T-Birds confirmed to us that uh, they're, they're going to be really good again. Yeah, the T LCC, I was obviously impressed, you know, covering them with both games and uh, impressed that they had consistent efforts from Trey Cobbs, from Dan Tez Walton, from Jake Williams. But perhaps the biggest number to me was seeing this team, like I have the last six years now in high school basketball, and seeing the job, the clinic, in my opinion, they put on, on the boards, both offensively and defensively. If you were just statting the rebound total alone, it was plus 28 against Bath on Friday night. It was plus like 22, if I remember right, against Shawnee. I mean, if they play at that level, you know, all season on the glass with Jake Williams, Dantes Walton, Trey Cobbs, and the like, and then have the other guys like the Nick Tafflingers, the Ethan O'Connors, the Josh Dixons of the world that help contribute to this team, they're going to be scary again. Well, I know Shawnee impressed you as well, even yes, though big they time. lost to LCC in the Elida Tip-Off Championship game. The fact they got there, a very tough team it looks like Shawnee's going to be this year. And let's face it, the WBL is a little bit of a wide open race. I think we OG is going to be at the top of that race. They had an impressive win over Brian. Salina, good first weekend for the Bulldogs as they beat Bell Fountain and Versailles. So, Don't uh, forget Defiance. Yeah. A lot of good schools in the WBL. And St. Henry was impressive in, in the MAC early, a big win over Spencerville and Football might have had a little bit to do with that and that St. Henry didn't have a postseason to deal with, but these a lot of these other Mac schools that St. Henry's going to be playing... Eventually played, they'll play. Eventually. Yeah. They just played five extra weeks, three of them, in Minster, Marion, Local, and Coldwater. So St. Henry could be a team to watch out for in the Mac. I think St. Henry, to begin with, is a team to watch out in the MAC. Just when you look at all their returning talent, it starts with Ryan Mikesell. The Dayton commit is back, you know, for his senior year. And I was talking with somebody just last week. We were talking about Division Three in general. And I said the first team that came to mind as far as teams to look out for, other than LCC, would be St. Henry. Just because they return so much, so much of that team runs through Ryan Mikesell and what he's able to do and what he's able to create with the basketball. He's a 6'7 wing guard that can bring the ball up to the floor. And Coach Miller, if he's at Dayton this time next year, is absolutely going to love this kid. Final note on the opening of the season. Wayne Trace defeated Crestview in the Van Wert tip-off championship game. It's something they tried to do three times last year and couldn't. So Wayne Trace, definitely another team to be Reckon with as we move on. You know what, Matt, before we wrap that up, one thing we didn't necessarily learn this year yet, but what we've learned from previous years is don't put too much <laughs> stock in the opening week. Right, you're going to bring us back down there. Yeah. Yeah, we were so, crowning champions already. Yeah, let, whatever, let me take it back to, to 2009, 2010 for a second, fellas. Yeah, whatever we think we learned, pump the brakes a little bit. Let's yep. let the season play out. Okay. Well, basketball is just starting, but football. Just finished. We had a great championship weekend in Columbus at the Horseshoe. Three MAC schools picking up state titles. Very exciting. Minster come from behind. And let's start with Minster. I mean, what a what a win for the Wildcats and, and the entire community, given what had happened in the previous week. Yeah, and Minster now that's two for them. So they joined the multi-state championship crowd. Uh, that's always uh, great. And I, I, I was trying to think. I meant to look this. Was Minster the first MAC school to win a state football title in '89? I believe you I are think they're correct. Right. I think they were the first. Running yeah. the single wing, if I remember right. Yeah, so uh, congrats to Minster. And their former coach, Nate Moore, won a title with LaSalle. So it, it was uh, really a, a neat weekend for the Minster folks. I'm sure Coach Moore, in the midst of preparing his team, was really rooting hard for his former guys at Minster. So great, that means great really story. the Mac won four state titles since <laughs> Nate Moore was at Minster before going to LaSalle. That. So let, let, let's give another state title for the Mac there this you go. year. You look at what happened in Columbus, and I know this part of the state was very glad that the state football championships moved back to Columbus. It's a much easier drive, much shorter drive, and it seemed like there's a lot of folks that had that same thought because the attendance for this year was well and above the attendance from last year, and it certainly wasn't good weather this year for the state championships in 
Ohio Stadium. Fantastic game to start it off on a Thursday night between Incredible Toledo Central game. Catholic and Athens. I, I personally hope this is really going to cement Columbus as being the home for the state football championships for the next decade. They have it next year, but after 2015, it's an open question. Right, now Dr. Ross was on at halftime of yeah, one of that. the games on, uh, on STO as part of the broadcast that he discussed it, and he did bring up 2016 and the construction that's going to be going on at, uh, around, Fawcett. Uh, around with Fawcett, and there's also some stuff I believe going on, uh, but Stark County at the same time as well. So there is going to be a lot of question marks, but I loved it being in Columbus. I wasn't there. I know, Matt, you were there. You were, you were trending worldwide on Twitter <laughs> while being there. Um, Garrett Seawright from the radio station was there covering it with 419sports.com. That first game set the tone, I think, for the entire weekend. Even though it rained, it was wet, it was cold all weekend. It was just great to see. And, hey, while we're at it, we may as well throw Toledo Central Catholic into the area mix because they do play in the track. They brought a lot of people to Lima back in week nine as well. It was just a that game right there, I thought, set the tone for the whole weekend. It really certainly, did. there's a lot of concern about how games would play out in front of 100,000 empty seats. You, it didn't sound empty. No, not, not at, at all. all. You've got a lot of concrete and a lot of steel that that noise is able to echo off of. I think it sounded good. I think it was a success. I, the other thing, too, and you go, I want to go back to the sound and the acoustics, you could hear the crowd mics and the positioning that they had. You could hear the people playing as day. I remember watching, you know, the TCC fans. You could hear them yelling, we just won state, baby, and all this other stuff. It was really cool that even though it didn't seem like there was a lot of people there, the noise was there. It was, you know, like there was 20,000 people yeah, there. Yeah, the, uh, the sound engineers did a nice job uh, for STO and for the OHSA radio mm -hmm. uh, that I know both of our stations carried some of those broadcasts. Uh, bottom line, guys, Mark, I did the math, up 54%. Yeah from yep. Stark County to Columbus, there's no reason to go back to Stark County. And, I, and, and I it's love not what like there's a did. lot of Columbus teams. That, that's right. why you had a huge bump. Huh. It, no, there were no. It, I mean, was, it was your basic state tournament with teams from all parts of the state, right. but it's a lot easier to get to Central Ohio. The reason why Columbus is the capital, the reason why it was placed in the middle of the state was to make it easier to travel there in yes. the early 1800s. It's still easy to travel there in the early 2000s. Yes. We need to talk to Tim Street at the OHSA. At the OHSA, he needs to bring you and I in to do the games. So. <laughs> you, guys, you, were some, you were in the big ball of the games. I, I was set to do one yeah, of the games, right. but the Bowling Green basketball schedule then was uh, modified, so I couldn't do one. But uh, the, the bottom line is, it's nothing against Stark County, and I think sometimes they try to portray it as something that was taken away from them, when in fact it never would have went there if Ohio State hadn't thrown them out of the stadium because they put real grass in there. It should be in Columbus. It will be in Columbus. And when you add 50% to your ticket sales, mm. your bottom line just went up. And with the way OHSAA has struggled in attendance with some of its other tournaments, there's no reason to move back to Stark County. It ain't gonna. Trips to Hawaii are back. All right, you two campaigned for it with Tim to get on the call. And, and then also, I mean, we didn't even mention Coldwater and Marion in that discussion because we're just so used we'll to them. We've talked about winning. them so many times. Yeah. You know? I mean, Insert congrats. Thomas from 2008. Right. Congrats Insert to them. Another dominant performance. So now let's talk about the team that normally plays at Ohio Stadium. And they made the playoff. I was so excited. Watch, I'm sure like everybody watching this uh, reveal at, at, a, at 1240, whatever it was, on uh, Sunday. And they're in. Now do they have a shot against Alabama? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is not the Alabama from the last couple of years. Alabama's got some very inconsistent quarterback play. Their secondary is a little bit suspect, suspect. It's a good Alabama team, but as we saw against Wisconsin, if Ohio State plays as well as they're capable of playing, they can not only play with anybody, they can beat anybody. And also keep in mind, against Wisconsin, we did not see the offense use the tight ends, and Dontre Wilson is supposed to be back for the bowl game for the Buckeyes as well. You know, one of the other things, too, that I took is, and we've talked about this on this show, and and also off the air as well is that arguably Ohio State is the hottest team in the country right now, you know, with the exception of maybe Oregon. And you take Ohio State and what they're doing right now, I, I, would, put a, I would have put them last week before the Wisconsin game up against anybody, would continue to do so. And whether or not it's Cardell Jones at quarterback or whoever it may be, you know, this team is humming on all cylinders. Mark, you got to watch them the other night from the bowels of, you know, the dome I actually was up in the press box I was pleasantly surprised nice. that I was able to, to watch the press box what we saw against Wisconsin is the vision that Urban Meyer has had for this team since he took over the job back in 2000 December of 2011 we've seen the offense all along with this team with, with the exception of 2012 
but the defense is finally what Urban Meyer has wanted to see defensively out of the Buckeyes, and that's, that was the more impressive part to me, not the 59 points, giving up, not giving up any points. Yeah, absolutely. And taking a running back, a Heisman caliber back like Melvin Gordon and just completely erasing him like that. All right, well, not to be a wet blanket, but you take away the running game when you're up 21, 24 nothing, and Wisconsin looks like they had the deer in the headlights. You can't run the that's football. A good point. Yeah. And let's also remember this team gave up points to Michigan who couldn't cross the street against Northwestern. So it's been a bit uneven. Alabama is certainly a much more multidimensional offense under Lane Kiffin than right. they have been. They're a more multidimensional offense than Wisconsin is. But with the confidence this Ohio State defense is playing with, they can play with Alabama. Oh, there's no question about that. I, the thing I love is you've got two maniacal maniacs <laughs> <laughs> Saban yeah. and Meyer. And they've got four, like three they've and a half weeks. A, three and a half weeks yeah. to yeah. plan for each other. Their heads are going to explode. How, yeah. Here's the other superlative that I love about this matchup. Meyer, Lane Kiffin. If he's there, if he has, if somebody hasn't biting the bullet, you know, bit the bullet and hired him as a head coach. Well, yeah, because Lane Kiffin, sick. when he was at Tennessee, took some pot shots at Urban Meyer and Urban was at the Florida head coach, though. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly – I don't think they're exchanging Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. Remember when Lane Kiffin left Tennessee and took the USC job? I remember the video because ESPN had the Florida basketball game that night, and they got video of Urban checking his phone, and he just started giggling like a schoolgirl. <laughs> Uh, let's close with the NFL quickly. Browns, Bengals, huge game this weekend. And the big story, I remember a couple months ago, Rick, is Johnny going to start? Is he going to start? Well, Manziel's going to start this week, his first career start in the biggest game of the Browns season. Is it true that he's a midget? <laughs> According to uh, Marvin Lewis, it is. I'm not sure about he that. He backed off of I those, know, although know. in the press conference on I Wednesday, Cleveland did send a media <laughs> representative a Cleveland station sent down a media figure who is short of stature to kind of rub it into Marvin Lewis's face yeah I mean we shouldn't even care about that I don't he calls him a midget <laughs> no. or a giant or an idiot or a moron I don't care <laughs> he coaches the Bengals Johnny plays for the Browns you should call each other names the point is it's time for Johnny Manziel the Browns are reeling uh, Hoyer has been awful Browns have uh, got to roll the dice see yeah. what they have with Manziel if, Hoyer if, has not got this offense yeah. in the last several weeks you don't have anything to lose at this point. Maybe you can strike Yahtzee and get into the postseason right. with a hot streak on Manziel. You got nothing to lose. I mean, you score two defensive touchdowns and lose. Yeah. That tells you right there your offense is broken. And, but I, I don't want to put too much of this on Hoyer. Let's not forget the slide of this offense coincided with the arrival of Josh Gordon. Yes. You can't just plug somebody into an offense and then make him the focal point and think everything's going to work smoothly. Uh, that is a factor, but it's definitely time to give Manziel a chance. Didn't they also have an injury on the offensive line? Yeah, they've had that too. Yeah, yeah. when they lost Mac about four weeks ago, that, that hurt him tremendously. Now he's been gone for a while, but really th things have been regressing. It's not just Hoyer, so uh, it's not like going to switch a quarterback and things are going to magically start working, but Manziel's escapability, improvisational skills might be more suited to what the Browns can do right now. Right. I, I've made it perfectly known on this program, I'm not a Johnny Manziel fan going back to his college days. I, I will say, however, I'm interested to see what he can do. He's been given the big boy pants now. And that one rushing learned. touchdown was pretty exciting. Against and, Buffalo? Right. That was cool. Yeah. I will say that. So if it's I, plays like that, I think maybe the Browns, that's what they're looking for anyway. Well, Johnny Fever is alive and well up in uh, – <laughs> Up in, uh, yeah, but Johnny <laughs> Fever's in WKRP in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> no, good stuff. Well, it'll be interesting. And we'll, we'll see. It's going to be a big weekend for sports, high school, college, and the pros. And thanks for joining us here on Press Row. We'll see you next time on WOSN.